Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 69, The Provisional Government. Russia, with the abdication of Nicholas II, was on the precipice of a glorious time. For the first time since the Vetches of Novgorod, the people were going to have a say in how their country would be run. Alas, this grand democratic experiment would only last a little more than seven months. Prince Grigory Livov, a member of an important Zemstvo, was the prime minister of the newly formed provisional government. Livov, while the face of the new government, was not the most important member. Pavel Milyokov, the foreign minister and member of the cadet party, and Alexander Kerensky, the most liberal member, were the most influential. Kerensky was by far the most powerful person, as he was not only a member of the provisional government, he was a member of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. This Soviet, along with the others dotting the Russian landscape, would severely undermine the provisional government, something this fragile group did not need. The Soviets, kind of the real power now, as a provisional government had no real way of enforcing its authority. The Tsarist secret police were disbanded, and the military forces in the two major cities, Petrograd and Moscow, were more and more in line with the Soviets. And honestly, while the members of the provisional government were pretty liberal, most of them were members of the elite part of society, not in touch with the peasant class or the industrial workers. The Petrograd Soviet made sure that they were the real power when they issued the famous Order Number 1, which told the military that they should select a representative to the Soviet and that the Soviet would be the ultimate authority in Russia. A new dictatorship was in the making, and the provisional government was incapable of doing anything about it. The Bolsheviks saw the Soviets as their ticket to power. With Nicholas in custody, one of the first things the new provisional government did was to round up and arrest those associated with the Tsarist regime. The Board of Inquiry was put together, whose expressed purpose was to, quote, investigate the activity of dark forces, unquote, who improperly influenced Tsar Nicholas II, and it was named the 13th Section. The full name of this body of men was the Extraordinary Commission of Inquiry for the Investigation of Illegal Acts by Ministers and Other Responsible Persons of the Tsarist Regime. This commission was led by F.P. Simpson, aided by Vladimir Intikon Rudnev and Grigory Girchich. Their interrogations were mostly held either in the Peter and Paul Fortress in Petrograd or the Winter Palace. Transcripts of the interrogations were prepared by Russian poet Alexander Bloch. The focus of the commission was on a few people who were deemed to be part of the dark forces, namely Grigory Rasputin and Sarina Alexandra, along with their associates. The interrogation transcripts were mostly lost to history until perestroika came about in the 1990s, as the Bolsheviks were particularly uncomfortable with some of the revelations that were uncovered. Now, I'm sure that some of you are wondering, uh, how did this provisional government come about? We have to put this in perspective first. Neville Chamberlain put the collapse of the Romanov rule and the setting for the new government into perspective when he said the following, quote, The collapse of the Romanov autocracy in March 1917 was one of the most leaderless, spontaneous, anonymous revolutions of all time. While almost every thoughtful observer in Russia in the winter of 1916 to 1918 foresaw the likelihood of the crash of the existing regime, no one, even among the revolutionary leaders, realized that the strikes and bread riots which broke out in Petrograd on March 8 would culminate in the mutiny of the garrison and the overthrow of the government four days later. Or, as Ryazanovsky and Steinberg put it, the imperial regime died with hardly a whimper. The members of the Fourth Duma on March 11, 1917, 
set up the provisional government, bypassing Nicholas II's decree, passing the mantle to his brother Michael. March 12th saw the formation of the Petrograd Soviet as a counter to the provisional government. Whereas most of the world recognized the government led by Livov, the reality was the mass of the people viewed their new leaders as nothing more than a group of bourgeoisie elitists, except for Alexander Kerensky, the only socialist in the group. What is interesting about the Soviets is that they were far more moderate than many have been led to believe. The radical Bolsheviks were actually in the minority, with only 105 seats, compared to 285 seats held by the Socialist Revolutionary Party and 245 by the Mensheviks. The Soviets of Petrograd felt the pulse of the people, while the provisional government held the pulse of the elite members of society. The way I like to put it, the nouveau boyars, as we might like to think of them in a historical sense. Russia, at the time of the March Revolution, was a chaotic place. The ravages of World War I were racking the country and depressing the people. Tens of thousands of deserters flooded the cities and the countryside, spreading discontent. Public transportation was sporadic. Inflation was exploding. Industry was stagnant at best. The whole of the Russian economy was collapsing. The provisional government under Livov was an emasculated group of privileged men incapable of handling the enormous issues facing this enormous country. Livov was forced to resign, handing the Prime Minister's job to Alexander Kerensky. Kerensky, though, was in an impossible position, with no real power with which to change the condition of the common Russian person. The Soviets had neutered the government, but Kerensky also bobbled the ball by not doing the things that would have placated the people and quelled the revolutionary spirit that was sweeping the countryside. The first order of business in hindsight should have been the ending of Russian involvement in World War I. The slaughter of brave and ill-equipped Russian men was staggering. The war was immensely unpopular with the people, but the provisional government was in a quandary. The French and British allies were democratic countries, mirroring their ideals of the ruling ministers and the provisional government. The Germans were the same autocratic ilk that the now deposed Tsar was akin to. What to do? What to do? Kerensky wrongly chose to stay in the war, which brought him few allies in Russia. The Germans, though, for their part, wanted to further destabilize the government in Russia in order to free their eastern front, allowing them to concentrate on the west, where the Americans were posed and poised to jump in. What the German government did was to help transport a number of Bolshevik leaders to Russia by Finland in a secret rail car. One of the members of this group was Vladimir Lenin, who was hiding out in Switzerland. Lenin, for his part, was frightened about returning to Russia, as he was a wanted man but he knew that the instability was just what he needed to grab power. In Marxist-Leninist theory, revolution over the autocracy had two phases. First was the bourgeoisie overthrow of the Tsar, which Lenin believed had occurred with the March Revolution. The second was to be the Socialist Revolution, which was but a natural event after the bourgeoisie failed the people. His viewpoints were an elixir to both the peasants and the industrial workers. The people were intoxicated with his and Trotsky's impassioned speeches, spread by pamphlets and newspapers throughout the Russian Empire. Still, Lenin's position was in the minority. Even within his own party, the time was still not right to strike. After Livov's resignation, along with a few of his allies, Kerensky's power was increased, especially with the addition of five socialist ministers. Chaos within the ethnic groups like the Ukrainians increased. In late July, a group of Bolsheviks tried to seize power on the 18th, but failed due to the lack of support by much of the Petrograd military. Lenin, for his part, was against the move, as he felt it very much premature.
Its failure vaulted Lenin to a leadership role because of his vision. The provisional government cracked down on the revolutionaries, arresting many of them. Lenin escaped to Finland. Now Kerensky faced opposition from both the left and the right. The conservatives, who still backed the Tsarist regime, felt Kerensky was too socialistic, while the left felt that they were not progressive enough. Then came the Kornilov affair. Lavra Kornilov, a simple Cossack by heritage, was named commander-in-chief of the army and decided to attack the Bolsheviks and the Soviet in Petrograd, seeing them as a threat to the provisional government. Kerensky, mistakenly or misguidedly, felt that Kornilov was a threat to him, and he rallied the people to defend the city against what he felt was a pro-Tsarist threat, which it was not. Prime Minister Kerensky freed many of the Bolshevik leaders to help with the defense, which, in hindsight, was a huge mistake. Kornilov, beset by numerous roadblocks in opposition, was stopped and arrested short of his goal. The right was now furious with the Kerensky government and withdrew all support. Lenin was to turn to return to Petrograd in disguise, ready to lead the Bolsheviks to power. But first, the Bolsheviks had to gain the majority of seats in the Petrograd Soviet, which they did on September 13th. Lenin returned, secured in his position of authority on October 23rd. He urged his people to begin preparations to seize power. Leon Trotsky, born Leon Bronstein, was instrumental in gathering the power and muscle Lenin needed. Kerensky, for his part, was unable to find any muscle with which to support his government, which I believe was mainly due to his refusal to abandon the war effort. In July, he had even tried to mount an offensive against the Germans, which, while initially successful, proved to be yet another Russian disaster. His regime and rule over Russia was collapsing all around him. Now, one of the main faults of Kerensky's vision of Russia was his insistence that any social changes only occur after democratic elections, which he proposed for November of 1917. The only problem was he had no infrastructure in place to even think about holding an election. His apparent indecisiveness in the light of this pig-headed ideal of democracy at all costs was to be his downfall. On November 7, 1917, or October 25th, using the old-style Russian calendar, the Bolsheviks struck. By November 8th, the Bolsheviks stormed the provisional government stronghold at the Winter Palace and arrested all of the members of the government they could find. Kerensky had escaped just hours before and was to live out his life in exile. Join me next episode when I cover the Second Revolution of 1917 and the start of the Russian Civil War, which culminated, culminated with a complete takeover by the Bolsheviks, led by the dictatorial and egomaniacal Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And now for a reading from Russian history. This one comes from well, one that I've read from before called The Memories of the Russian Court, uh, by Anna Virubova, who is the uh, personal friend and confidant of uh, Tsarina Alexandra. And this is about when the uh, notice came to her and the family of the abdication of Nicholas II. There was now in an or, or about the palace practically no one to defend the imperial family in case the mob decided to attack. Still, the empress remained calm saying only that she hoped no blood would have to be shed in their defense. A telegram from the emperor revealed that the crisis had become known to him, for he implored the empress to join him with the children at headquarters. At the same hour came an astounding message to the empress from Rodzianko, now head of the provisional government, notifying her that she and her whole family must vacate the palace at once. Her answer to both messages was that she could not leave, because all five of the children were dangerously ill. Rodzianko's reply to this appeal of an anguished mother was, quote, When the house is on fire, 
It is time for everything to be thrown out. Desperately, the Empress consulted doctors and nurses. Could the children be moved? Could Anna? What was to be done in case the provisional government pro proved altogether pitiless? Into this soul-wracking dilemma of the mother came to the wife of the Emperor the terrible news of his abdication. I could not be with her in that hour of woe, nor did I even see her until the following morning. It was my parents who broke the news to me, almost too ill and too cloudy of mind to comprehend it. Mademoiselle Den, who was with the Empress on the evening when Grand Duke Paul arrived with the fatal tidings, had described the scene when the broken-hearted Empress left the Grand Duke and returned to her own room. Quote, her face was distorted with agony. Her eyes were full of tears. She tottered rather than walked, and I rushed forward and supported her until she reached the writing table between the windows. She leaned heavily against it, and taking my hands in hers, she said brokenly, Abduqué. I could hardly believe my ears. I waited for her next words. They were scarcely audible. At last, still speaking in French for Mademoiselle, then spoke no English, she said, Poor darling, alone there in suffering, my God, what he must have suffered. In that hour of supreme agony, there was not a word spoken of the loss of a throne. Alexandra Fyodorovna's whole heart was with her husband. Her soul fears that he might be in danger, and that their boy might be taken from them. At once she began to send frantic telegrams to the emperor, begging him to come home as soon as possible. With the refinement of cruelty which marked the whole conduct of the provisional government in those days, these telegrams were returned to the empress marked in blue pencil, address of person mentioned unknown. Not even this insolence, no all her fears broke the sublime courage of the empress. When next morning she entered my sick room and saw by my tear-drenched face that I knew what had happened, her only visible emotion was a slight irritation that other lips than her own had brought me the news. They should have known that I preferred to tell you myself, she said. It was only when gone her rounds of the palace and was alone in her own bedroom that she finally gave way to grief. Mama cried terribly, little Grand Duchess Marie told me. I cried too, but not more than I could help for poor Mama's sake. Never in my life, I am certain, shall I behold such proud fortitude as was shown all through these days of wreck and disaster by the Empress and her children. Not one single word of bitterness or resentment passed their lips. You know, Anya, said the Empress gently, all is finished for our Russia. But we must not blame the people or the soldiers for what has happened. Too well we knew on whose shoulders the burden of responsibility really rested. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Now, don't forget to visit the Facebook page for the Russian Rulers History Podcast, where you can join in with the growing group, where you can ask a question, make a suggestion, or leave a comment. But as always, das Vidanya. Ispasiba Bolshoya.